the dean asked me to uh, to chair this uh, organization uh, several weeks ago, and um, I have to admit I was a, just a little bit hesitant because, uh, like many of you alumni here, I was one of the students of the Groms as we knew him back then, and um, it's he was he sets a very high bar for those of who you who don't know him. He was a fabulous professor. Uh, so it's a little hard to know just what to say that could honor uh, his legacy. Uh, as I was thinking about this, and Heather Olson, who's here this evening, helped me with uh, uh, some things, I, I, I started thinking about being a 1L student. And I realized, first of all, that was 35 years ago, that I sat in Professor Gromley's class for the very first time. And I started hearing these things like, and you guys who, who were in his class will remember, White Acre. Black Acre, springing interests, the rule in Shelley's case, the rule against perpetuities. Uh, there are probably a few of you here who could uh, recite, you know, the, no, the rule against perpetuities, which has something to do with no interest shall best or fail, and whatever. So I thought, what can I do? And, and I thought maybe what I should do is come up with a uh, hypothetical <laughs> and see if anybody remembers uh, how those transfers go. But uh, no, you can relax. <laughs> uh, what amazed me about Gromley, uh, Professor Gromley, was he could take these arcane concepts, these things related to property and trusts and estates and interests and things like that, and he actually had people sitting on the edge of their seats through his class. And no, he wasn't like Professor Kingsley, he wasn't sadistic. He really made it interesting and fun. And, uh, that's why I think he was such a great professor. He would give you the hypothetical and then he would look at somebody and say, what do you think about that one, Brian? And uh, of course, if you were daydreaming, that was a little bit embarrassing, but it was never intentional. Professor Gromley loved being in the classroom and he loved his students. He was born to teach, I think is what uh, Professor Meyer said at, uh, his, uh, at his wake. He never lectured, he was always, he always taught by questions, by answers, by trying the hypothetical, and he would start his class maybe with something simple and then drag it in, not drag it out, I shouldn't say that because it was fun. He would add facts and, and change facts and make it just entertaining uh, to the point where we were all very engaged uh, through the entire class. And he'd always stop and he had this way, and I, and I wish I could do it, but he, he put his hands up and he would say, well, what do you think about this? You know, and then he'd come up with something. He was very sly and, and humorous. Um, I, I took every class he taught, even though I didn't have any interest at all in practicing in this area. In fact, I'll tell you something. I took his bar review class for the Indiana bar, even though I was taking the bar in Pennsylvania. So, <laughs> he was that good. And his door was always open. You know, like all the professors, but, but Gromley in particular, his door was open. And you could always tell he was there because the other thing about Gromley was he loved cigars. And so you knew he was there because he wasn't the only one who smoked cigars, but Norma, his wife, told me he wasn't allowed to smoke at home. Now, I don't think that's the only reason why he spent so much time with his students and being in the law school, but uh, it was certainly something that uh, was of interest. Now, there's a lot about... Uh, the Groms that made him a character, and I did a little bit of work uh, before coming here tonight to find out a few things. You know, of course, we all knew his easy manner, his hypotheticals, his s sort of wry sense of humor. I will say, however, he was terrible at telling jokes. He would always botch the, the, the punchline. He had a kind of gentle drawl. But he was actually sort of an improbable lawyer. Uh, he was from western Pennsylvania, somewhere near Pux Puxatawney. And he went from high school to a community college. Now, eventually, he graduated from Kent State, and then he got his law degree at the University of Kentucky. And he worked for the government in the Department of Agriculture, and then a title company for a while, which he hated. And then he's taught at Nebraska, and he moved to, uh, I think it's called Willamette, Oregon, or Wilmette? Wilmette, Oregon, okay. Uh, and finally landed at Valparaiso in 1960, where he taught until his uh, sudden death in 1992. But it wasn't just the law and law students that had his interest. Professor Gromley was passionate about baseball. 
particularly the Pittsburgh Pirates. I learned from his wife, Norma, who, by the way, is still living and is in Valparaiso, that the one thing about Charlie, as she called him, that embarrassed her was his passion for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I don't think it's because she was a Cubs fan in particular, uh, and I'm not so sure he'd be uh, passionate he'd be about the Pittsburgh Pirates these days, but, uh, but this was his passion. Norma told me something else, and some of you may know this, but, uh, and by the way, he and Norma met in Washington. She was working as an aide to Senator Byrd at the time, uh, and then uh, left uh, with him uh, to travel around. But uh, Gromley almost became a professional baseball player. It happened this way. He joined the military in uh, World War II, but his eyes were so bad, Norma told me, that he couldn't get into the Army or the Navy, Navy or the regular service, so they put him in the Seabees. And the Seabees, for those of you who don't know, was the construction core of, the, I think, the Navy. And so he would go out to the islands in the Pacific and do advance work. Well, Norma told me that these guys, you know, it was hard, tough work going through the islands. But he had a lot of time on his hands, too. And they used to play baseball the CPs. And he struck up a friendship with someone from Minnesota uh, who was a baseball player, a catcher. She couldn't remember his name, but somewhere in Minnesota. And um, after the war, this catcher friend of his convinced him to join him back in Minnesota. And there he played third base. She thought it was for a minor league team. She didn't know for sure. So anyway, I thought it was interesting that the field of law almost lost Professor Gromley to the field of dreams. <laughs> but he came back. Uh, he even played at Valparaiso. I remember even when I was a student, he would play on the faculty team against the students. But anyway, back to the point. What can we do to honor Professor Gromley's legacy? What he did for us? And we're all here tonight because uh, we've shown a commitment to the law school. And it's a commitment that honors what the law school, through Gromley and through other professors of his type, of his similar dedication, showed to us while we were there as students. Last Friday evening, I was able to join the students in the 1L class of this year, and I think some of you were there as well. And that was, again, <laughs> bringing back memories of uh, my 35 years ago. But this was at a welcome dinner for the 1L class. And it, it's a wonderful thing, the, the black and the Latino law students sponsor this, and I'm told we're the only law school in the country where the minority students welcome the majority, they welcome everybody. And it's a great event, but what really impressed me, and maybe because I was thinking about this, was how many professors were there at that dinner on a Friday night. And President Heckler, you were there, Dean, you were there, I know others. It's, it's just a great thing uh, to see. And I think of that as the legacy of Professor Gromley and his dedication to the students. But I hope we can, you know, in this society of ours, find ways to continue that legacy and to do more for the law school. And maybe you'll hear about more of that in the coming days. I'll finish with this. Norma Gromley said to me in one of our telephone conversations that she thought that maybe someday the society would fade away. She said, it's because it won't be long before nobody remembers Charlie. Uh, I told her, I didn't think she had to worry about that with this group. So, welcome, I'm glad you're all here. Well, now, uh, Leanne, I think, is uh, going to lead the conversation. We're sitting around sipping tea and talking. Whereas this actually is a group of people who are very deeply engaged in the life of the law school, who are invested in our success and who are active in their gifts, their time, and their care. And I must tell you, it is extraordinarily good to have friends like you, people who are so engaged, so active, so involved, and so giving. And it's particularly important now to have friends like you because law schools are under great stress. Uh, the economics that began with the Great Recession that hit us four years ago have begun to very seriously affect law schools and legal education today. The impact is on the economics, the finances of law schools, it is on the number of students coming into law school, and it is on the employment prospects of law schools. And because of these stresses, law schools are now under attack widely. 
as being organizations, as institutions, which really don't do a good job of giving value to their students. We read this all the time. I will say that um, Valparaiso, notwithstanding the stresses, notwithstanding the attacks, is actually in quite good shape. Um, it is true that our class size was down this year, but the quality and the character of the students we brought in was quite extraordinary. Um, in the face of many challenges, we were able to bring in a class once again that was one-third underrepresented minorities, people who were serious, who were mature, who had every indication of being very <coughs> successful students and very successful lawyers. Our finances are good. We are solid. <coughs> We're a well-managed institution. I think that we can see our way to work through the challenges. And the energy of the people in the law school and the interest of people and the commitment to the mission is very, very high. And I think a major reason why we are doing well, even in the face of challenges elsewhere, is that we at Valparaiso have long been concerned with the delivery of value to our students. We understand that we have a commitment and obligation to give our students what they seek, which is an education that is high in quality, high in value, high in opportunity for success, but also provide people with a pathway to a successful and satisfying career. It's for that reason that we've invested for so long in the many clinics that we have, the externships, the skills program, a strong program in writing and communication skills, which is the foundation of any successful practice, why we teach people to be lawyers, why we teach lawyering above all, why we have invested in a strong and robust and diversified career planning center, and why we are so concerned to make sure that our students, when they graduate, take satisfaction not only in what they have achieved in law school, but in what they're going to do to serve not only clients, but to serve a greater good. That is why we say proudly that we have a commitment to teaching from the perspective of law as a calling. And our commitment to values goes beyond a commitment to providing value to students. We're committed to providing value to the employers that hire our students, to the university of which we are a part, and to you, our alumni and supporters. We know that you give time and resources, and commitment to our school, and that you gain value and satisfaction from doing it. You gain satisfaction from the tangible results of your commitment of your gifts in Heritage Hall, the new student cafe, in the career planning suite, in the library. You take satisfaction and pride from the intangibles that your gifts, your resources, your commitment provide in the support for student competitions, for student travel, for conferences, and for the add-ons to education that make for such an enriching experience. And above all else, we know that you take satisfaction from playing a central role not just in sustaining a great law school, but in ensuring its progress. Ensuring that our law school will be a source of pride to students, to employers, to alumni, and to all other people who take part in it. So thank you for being so active, for being so engaged, and for being such great friends. We look forward to many more years, indeed an endless number of years of working with you and other people like you in making this such a wonderful school, a wonderful community, and a wonderful society. Thank you so much, and I would now like to introduce our great friend, President Mark Heckler. Thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Uh, the Gromley Society is our only named society uh, at the university uh, among all the giving societies that we have, and I think that's a real testament to Professor Charlie Gromley uh, that his uh, legacy is remembered with such fondness uh, that uh, the society is uh, named in his honor. Let me just take a moment, uh, on your chair uh, when you arrive, you don't need to dig under it now, I just want to uh, just tell you what this is and you can take a look at it when you get home. We just released uh, the, the university's master plan. Uh, the master plan is the, uh, is the uh, embodiment of the, what the future physical campus is going to look like about 20 years from now. And uh, sometimes uh, master plans are generated. People take a look at them and they think, well, my gosh, there's another pipe dream. These folks are you know, busy making plans. But I pulled out, when we started this process, I pulled out the master plan from 1981, and they did it all. They did it all, just little by little, gift by gift, project by project, you actually transform a campus. And so this is the roadmap for what the future is going to look like uh, at Valparaiso University. For those of you that are law graduates, uh, some things to uh, just point out when you take a look at it. We, uh, we do plan to 
uh, create a more substantive law campus uh, on that, uh, that part of and that plot of land uh, where uh, Wiesman Hall currently sits. So you'll see several new buildings uh, in the plan there uh, surrounding a quadrangle courtyard area. We're going to be closing off Linwood Avenue so that Linwood Avenue becomes the entrance to the law school, not the cut through to downtown. So you literally come uh, Linwood off of 30 and uh, we'll, we'll have a nice, uh, uh, a nice kind of period street lamps that will take you down Mound Street. All of those uh, big old residence halls and fraternity houses will go away. Uh, and we'll just create a real sense of arrival uh, and this kind of prestige that we want to have uh, as we approach the law school. Um, and uh, if any of you were fraternity members there as undergraduates, we have new locations for those fraternity houses. Don't worry, they're not, they're not going away. Uh, we're just, we just have a better location uh, for, uh, for where those will be in the future. Uh, so you're here tonight. Uh, because you want to support uh, a law school that did a lot of things for you. One, uh, put you through a pretty rigorous education. You lost a lot of sleep. Uh, you spent a lot of time really honing your thinking skills, learning how to write well, learning how to stand on your feet and communicate with confidence, uh, and, uh, and really learning about uh, what it means to uh, be called to the legal profession. Those are things that were inculcated during your time. Your character was formed as a professional uh, during those years at the law school, and largely by example of the students that were alongside you and the professors who mentored you. But perhaps uh, I hear uh, of no one more fondly rem remembered uh, than Charlie, uh, Professor Gromley, who served from 1960 to 1992, 32 years, a mentor who instilled values, who built character, who impressed upon his students the importance of ethics in the practice of law. His intense focus on inspiring individual, individual students helped to prove that a compassionate law school was a better law school. It didn't, always, it didn't have to be like every other law school. The compassion could be part of the mix. He demonstrated that developing a sense of social responsibility produced better law practices. And his teaching surrounded this ideal that the law is an effort to improve society by making it more just for all of its citizens. And you share his vision. You were raised under his tutelage and you shared his vision. And you know that we have got to maintain these kinds of expectations for the students who come to us today. Because uh, if, if there was ever a need for ethics in practice, if there was ever a need for social responsibility, if there was ever a need for justice, today is the day and this work continues to need to be done uh, in this law school. And so you've made a commitment in his memory to his legacy, not only because you've given to the society, but because you've gone out and you've carried those ideals into your work. And so uh, I can't remember the exact comment you, you uh, uh, you made, Jean, but you know, you think about what what a legacy is for for a professor. A legacy for a professor is what you do in practice. That's what a professor is aiming for. And so, you know, Charlie's very much alive in every transaction you have with a client. Every time you mentor somebody in the in the law, uh, Charlie's work continues to go on and on and on, and you can't measure the power of that uh, over time. So I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart that you've been willing to make personal sacrifices and to steward your gifts to support the society. It means a lot to us because it helps us to keep that work going generation after generation after generation. Uh, and I promise you that we're going to continue <coughs> to build and to grow and support that law school. That's what we're here to do. And it's with your help that we're able to do it. Everywhere I go, everybody I talk to, and uh, last year I did 18 cities, kind of meeting folks and lots of law graduates all over the country, and you folks are everywhere. Um, but, uh, but there are three things that, that I do ask folks to think about, and one is we always ask you, when you're out in the field and you see potential promising law students, that you suggest that they take a look at Valparaiso University. Continue to do that. That's a great help to us. And alongside that, on the other side, perhaps, even more importantly these days, if a law student picks up the phone and calls you or sends you an email, a Valpo student, just give them a hand. Whether that's advice or just opening a door, 
you know, they got to get that job on their own. But if there's something you can do to help them, give them a hand. Uh, because you know for you that those hands meant a lot, just those opportunities that opened up. So to the extent that you can do that, please continue to do that. We ask for your financial support. It's more important than ever uh, that we continue to do that. And so to the extent that you can, you're able, we'll just ask you to please continue that support. Um, we uh, especially are working and focusing now on endowment. Uh, that's really critical for the sustainability of the university. And so uh, you'll see and certainly hear a lot from me over the next years uh, about the gifts that you might be able to make that support the university and particularly uh, financial support for students in perpetuity. Uh, because that's how we've been able to build the law school and that's how in our time we'll continue to build that law school forward uh, into the future. Uh, and then finally, uh, to the extent that you are called, hold us in your prayers because that's important too. Probably the most important thing. So those three things, if you can do for us, uh, that, that, that would be, a, that would be a, a great blessing to us. So again, thank you for your support for the Groundly Society. We're honored uh, tonight that you came together. And I have the pleasure to introduce a wonderful young man to you. His name is uh, Brian Rogers, a current a 3L honors a student, uh, also a recipient of a Gromley scholarship, so you can see how your gifts have direct impact uh, on our students. He's also uh, the law student division representative to the ABA Board of Governors. Uh, so he is uh, working at a national level uh, with the American Bar Association and really uh, does us uh, uh, quite proud and, uh, and a great honor for the university as well. And I think you'll be pleased to hear about uh, his experience. So please, without further ado, welcome Brian Rogers. Welcome. How is everyone? Thank you very much, President Heckler. Um, it really, it's interesting. I have to go last after the Dean and Mr. Spoon and President Heckler, and I have to think of refreshing things to say, so I'll do my best. Um, welcome, and thank you all for being here. As President Heckler said, my name is Brian Rogers, and I'm a 3L student. Understanding that I'm also the person keeping you from being able to get up, move around, have another cocktail, uh, I'll do my best to keep it short. But it's really going to be difficult when this involves talking about Professor Charles Gromley. To begin, as it's been said, I am a recipient of the Charles Gromley Scholarship. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's given to a second and third year student at the end of every year, is voted upon by the faculty and staff. I received this last year at the end of the year, right before finals, and um, you can only imagine, as many of you know what it's like right before finals, how amazing it was to receive this about an individual who's so wonderful. Importantly, the description of that scholarship is really indicative of the individuals that are here. Caring, compassionate, excuse me, caring, compassionate, and highly competent. Those things are what Charles Gromley was. It is you all who represent the absolute best qualities of Professor Gromley and his commitment to the law students and the law school. I know this not based on the stories, or not based on my personal experiences with him, obviously, but the stories that still echo the hallways each and every day. Professor Berner was telling me a couple stories about Professor Gromley. He's one of the individuals, obviously, I'm sure many of you remember. And he was telling me a couple of these sayings that he used to have. And one of them in particular was, you know, you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can make him, you wish you could have drunk. You all in many ways do that each and every day with not just your financial commitments to the law school, but through your time commitments as well. Thumbing through a tribute edition of the Amicus Alumni Magazine from some years ago, I stumbled upon a beautiful story about Professor Gromley. In this account, an individual asked Professor Gromley, what, what do you do? And without hesitation, his answer was, I'm a teacher. It wasn't, I'm an attorney, or a lawyer, or a professor, or even a law professor. It was, I am a teacher. Your support helps fund opportunities for faculty and staff to be teachers in their, way, their own ways. More importantly, your support helps advance students, student activities on multiple levels so that we can be students in the way Professor Gromley wanted us to be. The relationship is absolutely symbiotic. Through your contributions, we have a clinical program that 
rivals, if not outperforms every other program in the nation. And as said, I travel around and talk to a lot of law students. That's the absolute truth. A new student lounge that provides a comfortable and spacious working environment in the evening and a functional and relaxing atmosphere during the day just to hang out, have lunch in a nice environment. The Career Center expansion was monumental in helping students with career exploration during this increasingly difficult job market. Furthermore, it provides a positive work environment for our Career Center staff who worked so hard to better assist us in our postgraduate endeavors. And it provides a visually, and more importantly, it provides a visually appealing space to recruiters and other individuals who come to visit our law school. On a more personal level, as Dean Connison mentioned, the donations you provide allow for students to travel and attend conferences and functions around the nation. This enables us both to learn about new developments in the law and be exposed to a whole class of individuals we might not otherwise been able to. Aside from your financial support, which we obviously appreciate and encourage, um, it's your time and energy is what really, really matters. And I say this wholeheartedly. The guest lectures, the student mentoring, and the advocacy that you all do every day on behalf of the law school is absolutely unquantifiable. However, still, I encourage you to find more ways to participate in the law school. Aside from being beneficial for the students, I can promise you, you will find it equally satisfying when you are able to reach someone and tell them, I can help you reach your goals. I can promise you'll, excuse me, this was the only thing. Oh, man. You know, about six weeks in is when you start getting sick, and I'm sure you all remember it. <laughs> and it's just going around the whole law school, so excuse me. <laughs> this was Professor Gromley's principal purpose. Each time you extend a hand, you create a future alumnus who will not forget that moment and pay it forward once again to the next generation of students who pass through those doors and hear the never-ending stories about Professor Gromley and his almost prophet-like stature. Overall, it would not be difficult for me to continue down a list of what your contributions mean to the law school and particularly students such as myself. However, to close, I will share what your contributions to me personally, aside from the scholarship that I received in his name. Coming from the south side of Chicago and attending an all-boys Catholic high school, I have a deep understanding of loyalty and commitment. However, I went to school out west and it's a little different there. People weren't quite so proud of the place that they came from or the school they were attending. It was just where they were going to school. Thankfully, I can say I do not feel that lack of pride now. I do not expect to, to feel that once I conclude my three years here at Valparaiso. And I most certainly do not feel that in this room. I hope that you will continue to support individuals such as myself and allow us to feel that sense of pride that continually draws you all back each year. I thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening.